Hi, everyone. So I think we're about ready to begin our second panel. My name is Luma Cabaz, and I'm a senior studying international studies and journalism with a minor in Spanish. Um, first, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, the panelists and the students that have registered for the Global Student 7 sponsored lunch, that it will be held right after this panel is over in the Neil Marshall Black Culture Center right across the street. We are thrilled to give our students an opportunity to talk informally with our guests with, about their interesting and impactful prof professional accomplishments. Now it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second session of America's Role in the World. This panel is on the new Congress, War Powers, and U.S. Foreign Policy, a topic that is extremely relevant in our turbulent world today. We are honored to have IU's very own Provost Lauren Robel moderating this session. As well as being the provost of IU Bloomington, Ms. Robel is a Van Nolan Professor of Law, as well as the Executive Vice President of Indiana University. Please join me in welcoming Lauren Robel and the panelists. Well, I, I cannot, well, first let me, let me start by congratulating the school on this, uh, what's turned into one of the most interesting set of events that happen on this campus every year. This one is happening at the same time we are engaged in a campus-wide uh, global arts and humanities festival, Mexico Remixed, and so the, our ability to, uh, to be in the world, engaged in the world, and proudly so is really facilitated by the work that this school does and that this conference does. We have a terrific set of panelists today to take on uh, the, the questions around uh, foreign policy, the Congress, and the war powers, the deep questions. We've got a lot of uh, law power up here, but at the end of the day, this is a set of deeply human questions as well. And so while we'll spend a little time uh, talking about the law, we, mi we might want to get at some point into the more, uh, the, the more political and human side of the, of the world. But let me briefly introduce our panelists. I'll start with uh, Harold Coe, my, uh, my dear friend and a dear friend of Indiana University. Um, professor Coe is Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale Law School. He returned to uh, Yale Law School in January 2013 after serving for nearly uh, four years as the 22nd legal advisor of the U.S. Department of State. Professor Coe is one of the country's leading experts in public and private international law, national security law, human rights. He's the recipient of the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award. And he has received 17 honorary degrees and more than 30 awards for his human rights work. He's a prolific author and um, has co-authored, in fact, with one of our, our own faculty members, Hannah Buxbaum. Brian McCune is Senior Director of the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement. He has 30 years of experience in all three branches of the federal government, including high-ranking positions in, let's see if I can, I can manage all of my pieces of paper up here high-ranking uh, national security positions in the White House, the Defense Department, and the U.S. Senate. Uh, Brian served in several positions in the Obama administration. At the Defense Department, he served as Principal Deputy and Undersecretary for Policy, and concurrently as Acting Undersecretary for the final seven months of the President's tenure. In the White House, Brian served as Deputy Assistant to the President, Executive Secretary, and Chief of Staff of the National Security Council, and as Deputy National Security Advisor to Vice President Biden. In the Senate, Brian served for 12 years as Chief Counsel to the Democratic members of the Committee on Foreign Relations. And he, as well, has written on national security issues for various publications and is often, I often see you on television these days. Uh, Jennifer Rubin is on fire right now. You probably are reading her <laughs> columns daily as I am. Uh, I, I open the post first thing in the morning to see them. She, she uh, is an opinion writer for the Washington Post. She covers politics and policy, foreign and domestic, and provides insight into the conservative movement, the Republican and Democratic parties, and threats to Western democracies. 
Uh, Jennifer, I also see you on MSNBC every once in a while. Um, Jennifer joined the Post after three years with commentary and prior to her career in journalism, uh, Jennifer Rubin practiced law for two decades, an experience that informs and enriches her work. And finally, Jake Sullivan is a non-resident senior fellow in Carnegie's Geoeconomics and Strategy Program and a Martin R. Flug visiting lecturer in law at Yale Law School. Sullivan served in the Obama administration as national security advisor to uh, Vice President Joe Biden and director of policy planning at the US Department of State, as well as deputy chief of staff to Secretary Hil of State Hillary Clinton. He was the senior policy advisor on Secretary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign and previously served as deputy policy director on Hillary Clinton's 2008 presidential primary campaign. Well, we have a new Congress. Uh, we have di uh, divided government again. And the news is full of uh, members of Congress reasserting their branch's position as a co-equal branch of government. Uh, in fact, those, those uh, members of Congress may be understating Congress's power, you know, underestimating it. Uh, when Congress's power exists, it's plenary, and it's supported by the necess necessary and proper clause, so there's a lot of it. Properly conceived, Congress's power under Article I is, in, one might argue, near boundless. Uh, taxing, spending, control of commerce, the power to declare war, control of appropriations. And yet many people would argue, and many of you have argued, that Congress has ceded much of its power in many of these important areas, most of which at least touch on foreign affairs to the executive, whose powers over foreign affairs are much less articulated by Article II. Whether it's foreign uh, trade disputes, negotiations with foreign powers, uh, traditionally friendly or hostile to the United States, or even committing US forces to foreign soil or airspace, the executive has become the center of gravity uh, for foreign policy. So I thought perhaps we could start broadly and then narrow back down to the war powers uh, and, and start perhaps with Bruce, Bruce, do you, or Brian, do you agree that Congress has been too passive in foreign affairs? And if so, how can it reassert itself? I'm a little intimidated answering any questions in front of Chairman Hamilton, who uh, <laughs> knows more about Congress, and particularly the House, than I've ever, ever uh, will hope to gain, gain, but I will do my best. Um, Congress, asserts its power uh, in a bit of a pendulum swing, mm. depending in part on what's happening in the world at the moment, and also the raw politics of who's in charge. So when you have one party controlling the Congress or one house of a Congress and another party controlling the White House, you're gonna have more tension in Congress asserting itself. The presidential historian uh, Corwin said the Constitution allocation of powers on foreign affairs is an invitation to struggle. And Congress doesn't always take up that invitation if they're of the same party as the White House. Particularly in a, early in an administration when a president's getting his sea legs, figuring out what their policies are, the Congress members on, of the same party are gonna give that president a fair bit of running room. So what you see now with the new uh, Democrats in charge of the House. They got a little of speed bump in the form of the government shutdown that delayed some of the work they were setting out to do, but they've already asserted themselves in a few ways. They took a vote uh, in support of NATO a couple of months ago and purporting to try to prevent the president from withdrawing from the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Both houses have now voted uh, to invoke the War Powers Resolution to for, try to force withdrawal of our support for the Saudi Emirati adventure in Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the votes of both houses, which the President has already vetoed, of the National Emergency Declaration uh, related to the southern border. So Congress is finding these powers again and, and 
invoking its me muscle memory and, and starting to use the ones that you articulated. Well, Jake and Jennifer, could I ask you, you both written urging the new Congress to focus on national security and foreign policy issues. What would your top foreign policy priority be for Congress right now, and how should they attack it? Well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, I, too, feel a little shamed, I suppose, speaking in front of uh, Chairman Hamilton. But um, I think what we have right now, not only in the foreign policy realm, but in the entire management of government, um, is a highly dysfunctional White House that radiates chaos. And strangely enough, um, we get more stability, more institutional memory, more adherence to the rule of law and processes from the Congress than we do from the White House. It has traditionally not been that way. Um, one of the excuses, of course, for the accretion of power in the executive is you need the unified, organized um, tip of the spear to drive policy. Um, but now we don't have that. We have a very chaotic view. So rather than a particular area, though there are many wildfires around the globe, I would suggest there are really two things that Congress is um, most properly um, poised to do. And the first would be to exercise proper oversight. We don't think of oversight when we talk about um, war powers or we talk about um, these intersections in foreign policy, but that's perhaps the best tool that Congress has to call the administration to account, to try to figure out what the heck was going on over there, um, to um, have hearings to inform the public. I would say that probably the most effective foreign policy, national security um, related hearing I have seen the last couple of years, um, or last maybe decade, um, was under the tutelage of Senator Corker, who had a very informed dis discussion about first strike nuclear capabilities and who really has the power to initiate that. Is that properly um, a declaration of war within Congress's power? And just how much power does the president have? So the first thing I think would be um, adequate oversight. Um, and with that, um, a more exacting uh, confirmation process. Um, now that we've abolished um, the filibuster, um, you can sort of muscle these people through. Um, but there has to be some quality control that the Senate exercises, and they should look at their own record of having rubber stamped a whole series of people who have washed out uh, in national security for a variety of reasons. I think the second thing that Congress needs to provide is some continuity in terms of American values and American relationships. We already saw this, as you pointed out, with respect to NATO. Um, the rest of the world is somewhere between horrified, scared, shocked, dismayed um, at what they see. But when you have a enormous delegation of Congress, for example, that goes to the Munich conference, that does say something to our allies, that there is an understanding, there's an appreciation <laughs> for our democratic allies, it goes beyond one president. Um, you know, um, I'm sure veteran uh, senators will often say, um, either publicly or privately, presidents come and go, but Congress is there um, for the long haul. Um, so in showing up, in voicing support, um, in um, reiterating America's commitment to democracy, um, and in, I think, um, guarding very ger generously and jealously um, the power of the purse to fund those aspects um, that facilitate human rights um, advancement, that facilitate um, foreign aid, that facilitate um, a diplomatic um, the aspect as opposed to simply dumping money into the Pentagon. Um, we love the Pentagon, but they will tell you that um, if you're going to cut the State Department budget in, General Mattis' words, um, you're going to have to give him more bullets. So I think in those broad strokes, both in overslight slash um, uh, confirmations and in this kind of continuity of American uh, values and relationships are where Congress can be most effective, I think. Jake, are you in the same place? Uh, well, I would absolutely reinforce both of those points. I think Congress can do a much more intense job than it has of late of exercising accountability and oversight and of showing that American foreign policy is more than just the whims of one person, that there's 
an institutional continuity around values, around a commitment to American engagement in the world and so forth. I would just add that the area that I think needs most immediate and urgent attention on a bipartisan basis is to deal with the authorization to use military force in the various conflicts across the, band, the arc of instability from North Africa to South Asia. We are operating in multiple countries with, with multiple configurations of force under a resolution, an, an authorization that was passed in 2001 to deal with the fact that the Taliban were um, providing safe harbor to Al Qaeda. And now we're dealing with terrorist groups that didn't exist then in countries never even remotely in contemplation of the people who passed that authorization. And while I accept, and when I was in the Obama administration, I advocated for the fact that technically the 2001 AUMF does provide a legal basis for, for these ongoing efforts, I think it's high time for Congress to actually have a real debate. And this is not just a legal debate. Right. This is a debate about where we want to be engaged, with what means, for how long, against whom. These are huge policy questions, and we have not had that debate. And the reason we haven't had that debate is because it's easier for members to just say, let the, let the president deal with that. I don't want to make the hard calls or take the hard votes. I'll, I'll just give one anecdote. When, uh, when President Obama said that he was going to go to the Congress to seek authorization for strikes to respond to the Syria chemical weapons use in 2013, we, we would get calls. I, I was working in the White House at the time. Brian was there as well and, and can attest. We'd get calls from members, both Democrats and Republicans, who said, what are you doing? What, why, are you, why are you coming to the Congress? They'd say, well, so that you, know, you exercise your constitutional responsibility. And they'd say, well, we just want you to do it. Just do it. You know? don't, don't make us have to vote on it. Uh, and you know, if you asked people, kind of put your heads down on your desk and raise your hands, would you be for the president taking these strikes, you would have had a decent majority saying yes. But when it came time to actually putting people's money where their mouth was and having to take the tough vote and be responsible for it, members didn't want to do that. And I think that basic challenge, um, which comes against the backdrop of the presidency across administrations accreting power in national yeah. security and foreign affairs since the time Chairman Hamilton was sitting in his seat, is a, I think it is, is an unfortunate fact, and presidents have to deal with that. Uh, President Obama went also to the Hill and said, I'd like a new authorization for ISIS. And they basically said, we don't really want to do that. So President Obama had a choice, either develop a legal rationale under the 01A UMF and mm -hmm. take action he felt was necessary to defend the United States, or basically say, okay, I guess we can't do anything because Congress can't get its act together. So I think starting now, starting immediately, we have to have this debate. It has been 18 years nearly since that yes. uh, authorization was passed. The threat has changed, America's security posture has changed, and it's time for the authorization to change as well. Well, we might want to back up, and, and famously, members of Congress, when there were casualties in Niger, had no idea we were in Niger. Exactly. You know, that, that is a very long way, one might argue, from where, say, James Madison started <laughs> with the notion that there's no part of the Constitution that, is, uh, that has more wisdom than the clause which presides the question of war or peace to the le legislature and not to the executive and famously predicted that war would be the, the true nurse of executive aggrandizement. We have a general audience here. We have a wonderful expert on the, uh, the war powers. Harold, could I ask you to step us back a moment and talk more generally about how the Constitution arrays the war powers across uh, the Congress and the presidency, and then a little bit about how the We'll talk generally, uh, get into how the branches operationalize those constitutional commitments. So thank you. That ties together a number of the uh, excellent responses that were given. I think we have to face up to the fact that the Constitution sheds, sets forth a basic principle of shared power, checks and balances. But the political incentives of our current system push in favor of executive unilateralism. You know, the president, weak or strong, feels an imperative to respond. Congress, as you heard from Jake, um, loves to acquiesce and not be on the record, and then the courts tend to defer. So uh, it creates a, uh, 
uh, political dynamic, which is the opposite of what the Constitution requires. And that means that we need to have various forms of framework legislation that can bring it back into focus, designed by statesmen like um, Congressman Hamilton and, and uh, Senator Luger. I, I don't know, every morning I get up, Congressman, and I watch you know, Jim Jordan or uh, Steve King, and I, I think, uh, why am I watching these people? Uh, <laughs> oh. be, now, the, the, there were two big moments, historically, where efforts were made to sort of frame the space of the National Security Constitution. One was in the 40s and early 50s, when the Congress passed the National Security Act of 1947, and then the Supreme Court ratified a system of shared power in the steel seizure case. Mm -hmm. And that entrenched shared power as a vision for a generation. And then the second period in which uh, our two leaders were very much involved came in the late 70s after Nixon with uh, the War Powers Resolution, the National Emergencies Act, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, eventually the Intelligence Oversight Act. What we're distinctive about those is that they kind of frame the space in which the three branches could interact in a system of checks and balances. And what I think we need to acknowledge is that uh, these moments for this kind of structural reform come only in the wake of disasters. Um, in, in the case of uh, Nixon, Vietnam, and, and Watergate. I think we have to acknowledge we're pretty close to the same situation now. And there's another occasion to, to do so. Um, you know, when the, when the president invokes the National Emergency Act to get around pro Congress's power to um, uh, power the purse, or when we have a forever war that goes on for 18 years, uh, because Congress has passed a law that's endlessly allowing more names of groups to be added to a mm -hmm. constantly mutating list, then we have a permanent delegation of Congress's power to the president. And uh, so the, the solution has to be for Congress to now take the power back and reallocate it. Um, I, Brian said something very that shouldn't escape your notice, that Congress invoked the War Powers Act with regard to, War Powers Resolution with regard to Yemen. Yemen. You know, so we have this optimistic moment in the last week where um, th there's the vote by 12 Republican senators against uh, the claim of national emergency, uh, the unanimous vote to release the Mueller report, and the, um, uh, the vote on uh, Yemen. But the, f uh, the fact of the matter is, that um, the War Powers Resolution is just not any more relevant to the kinds of uh, actions that occur. It addresses the introduction of US armed forces equipped for combat into the airspace of a foreign country for more than 60 days. And we have cyber conflicts, use of special operations, private security contractors, and increasing use of um, artificial intelligence. And drones. And drones. Yeah. None of these are regulated by the War Powers Resolution. It's just been overtaken by time. So in addition to ending the wars, which is what Jake has been talking about, for Congress to actually decide who it wants to be fighting with and to whom, to which places it wants to be dispatching US military resources, it secondly has to decide uh, on a different structural approach to regulate um, the commitment of troops in the first place. Finally, my colleague at Yale Law School, the great Charles Black, once said, it's a crazy war powers resolution that never says when you can commit troops in the first place. Yeah. They can be there for 60 days before there's a problem. And that was a defect in 1973, and it's a defect now. Well, and, and just, just to be clear for the folks who maybe have not followed this as close as our panelists have, the, that underlying structure requires that when there are hostilities, uh, when the president commits troops and there are hostilities, uh, the president has 
60 days, is it, to get to Congress and, say, and tell Congress that, it's, um, that this is happening, get, 90, it, yeah. get its authorization, and Congress can stretch that out to 90 days. When Congress authorizes uh, the use of force, it does it through these authorization of use of force acts. It's nothing like uh, President Roosevelt standing in front of the Congress and declaring on December 8th, you know, asking the nation to declare war. So, but as, as Brian mentioned, we just last week had a, uh, an invocation of the War Powers Resolution with respect to Yemen, which is arguably the worst humanitarian crisis we're facing on the globe right now. And Jennifer, uh, the invocation was because of the, um, the disagreement that the Congress was trying to express over the murder of your colleague, Jamal Khashoggi. But was just Lauren, 10 seconds on that. Yeah. The War Powers Resolution was supposed to be self-executing. It was supposed to execute itself. It doesn't do that anymore. It has to be invoked. And it, to be invoked by Congress on a political basis, they have to do it in a sustained way, which they can't do. So it's broken. It's broken. But was that an important invocation? Uh, certainly this was um, a event which I think um, did what few par foreign policy events do, and that is which engages the American people. And fundamentally, in a democracy, um, we have to um, go back to the, the voters and the people. And I think what Congress got, um, because they are creatures of the ballot box and they are um, exquisitely sensitive to public opinion when their seats are at risk, is that there was genuine moral outrage. Um, now, you can argue that there should have been outrage over many more incidents involving many more people, but to invoke Stalin for a moment, you know, uh, a million people is a statistic, one person is a tragedy. Um, and mm. so in a very meaningful way, this event, I think, brought together several strands which highlight the difficulties we're having with this particular executive. Um, we had a refusal to inform Congress and an attempt to misinform Congress. Um, when you prevent the director of CIA from going up to the Hill to brief people for fear that she might tell the truth, we're in treacherous waters. When the Secretary of State dances on a pinhead trying to avoid saying that there's no smoking gun, no real evidence of this gruesome murder, we're in uncharted territories. Um, it brought us back to this bizarre situation in which we have a president who has financial interests in countries in which we have um, exceptionally delicate uh, foreign policy, national security issues. Um, we haven't even talked about emoluments today, but I'll spare you that one. Um, but um, real questions. Come back for another panel. Exactly. <laughs> we, we can do another one on that one. Um, but real questions about for the first time, I think, in our history, at least in my lifetime, whether the president's motives are pecuniary and personal or whether they are, um, however misguided or not, um, uh, on behalf of the country. Um, I think it also brought um, in focus the fact that um, whatever we thought of the JCPOA, I was on a different side from some of them, um, what we now have is a completely chaotic um, approach to the Middle East as a whole. Um, we um, have not replaced the JCPOA with any kind of coherent Iran policy, and therefore some of our policymakers have got it in their heads um, that we must now depend on Saudi Arabia or we will have no Iran policy, um, which is really the tail wagging the dog. So I think this brought together a whole nexus of very troubling issues. Um, and it took something of this magnitude, I think, to sort of jar and prompt um, Congress to act. And while you can make the argument that the murder of Jamal Khashoggi wasn't exactly related to Yemen, it was the closest thing at hand. Right. Um, and that was the most, they did pass a resolution that was you know, sort of a condemnation of not holding um, the uh, crown prince responsible. Um, but this was the closest thing at hand. Um, but I think Harold is right that um, this can't be episodic. This can't depend on a tragedy here or a catastrophe there. There has to be some kind of sustained, continuing um, 
uh, way to address this. And I would say, going back to my point about oversight, we haven't had a public hearing on the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And that, I think, has to take place. There is a function to be had by calling administration officials up, asking them to account for their behavior, bringing in experts, bringing in um, the members of the State Department who have deep knowledge in these areas, and airing those issues. And I think until you lay that predicate, it's very hard, or it's harder, for Congress to then jump into the fray on a sustained basis. They have to lay that factual and legal predicate, I think. Yeah. Well, I, I dismissed your emoluments remark maybe a little too quickly. <laughs> I know the, you know, the foreign emoluments clause is a, an important uh, constitutional limitation yes. on corruption that, that is designed to require a conversation between the president and the Congress around, um, around gifts and other kinds of, of, um, of well, emoluments that, um, that might be thought to influence foreign policy. And Congress has not, as far as I know, no. perhaps you, you know better, uh, requested any kind of oversight in this area. L or Lauren, it's, it, it's about more than that. Why on earth would the Saudi government go to our embassy in Saudi Arabia and ask for a meeting that goes back to the Secretary of State? Yes if they can instead send someone to sit in the Trump hotel and have a drink with a member of the president's family. The former is a open process. It's subject to cables. It's subject to congressional oversight. And it's subject to a democratic process. The second is secret and unmonitored. The Foreign Emoluments Clause is not just about people taking money. It's about, it's about whether we have a democratic process of conducting diplomacy. We're a long way from a world in which President Obama asked for a legal opinion on whether he could accept the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Um, before before we, we get too far away, though, from the, the underlying structure of war powers and AUMFs, I, I would like, some of you have had deep experience with AUMFs and the process of trying to uh, work between the executive and the Congress around that. Harold, you, you had a, uh, the responsibility of ha having to think that through during Libya. And maybe could you talk a little bit to, uh, to our audience about what kinds of considerations went into the decision, I, I believe, not to invoke um, the war powers resolution in, during the uh, activity in Libya? Well, I'd like to come back to the AUMF. I yeah. think the, an authorization for the use of military force has to have four characteristics. One is it has to end, it has to be sunsetted, it can't be perpetual. And Jake pointed out that yeah. it's, you know, we're in the longest war in American history. Um, and that's because the original AUMF never had an end date. Uh, second, it has to say who the enemy is, so that you know we may be fighting originally the people who attacked us on 9-11, but now we're fighting a different group of people in a different place. Third, it has to um, repeal old AUMFs when they no longer apply. So you know we had an AUMF for, for Iraq, yeah. And that was all directed against Saddam, who's been gone for 15 years. And finally, it has to require transparency. So um, the real problem now, again, is for these AUMFs, these original authorizations for use of military force, not to endlessly mutate. Because if they do, and you can keep adding enemies, the war goes on forever. And Congress never has to decide whether people ought to go off and get killed about these kinds of things. Now, with regard to the War Powers Resolution, this goes back to my original point. You know, the War Powers Resolution was an important moment when it happened, and it's actually worked for the kind of problem it was created for, which is very large-scale creeping wars like Vietnam. But it wasn't designed for the current situation. The term hostilities wasn't defined uh, in Libya. I've had this debate with, with many different people, but 
the amount of ordnance that was actually being used was less than 1% of what was being used in Kosovo. And so there has to be some level at which it's triggered. And at the end of the day, when the terms of the statute are not self-executing or self-defining, and somebody has to invoke it, then that requires a sustained exercise of political will, and Congress can't generate it. In, in the case of Libya itself, Secretary Kerry, uh, Nancy Pelosi, John Boehner, they all said the War Powers Resolution didn't apply, basically because they knew they couldn't put together a vote on it. Yeah. So does that indicate, what does that tell us about the AUMF process? I think I've heard several of you say that you think it's broken. We've, we're operating under an AUMF that is ancient. Um, we're probably on the verge of sending people to war who weren't born at the point the AUMF was passed after 9-11. After I know both uh, Senator Kane and Senator Corker have been working on, you know, trying to update um, the AUMF, but it, there's, uh, the process of those AUMFs is what we've got right now. Can it be made better? Brian or, or Jake, do you see a, do yeah, you see anything to be done here other than Congress reasserting some very basic um, war powers declaration? I want to defend Congress just a little bit, having worked there for 20 years. Cause, Thank you. Um, it, but I also have the experience from the executive branch that gave me a different perspective. Uh, I had a law professor, I'm sure you both know him before he passed, John Hart Ely, yeah. who wrote that, uh, a book on War Powers Resolution, and he had a law review article before that entitled, Suppose Congress Wanted a War Powers Resolution That Worked. Yeah. Uh, and his thesis was that Congress didn't found accountability to be a scary thing, referencing what Jake said. And when I was taking a class from him, I was still working in the Senate, and I took some offense at this concept because I had a boss, Senator Biden, who cared about uh, the war power. and. When we should be careful in saying that Congress thinks, because there are 535 members yeah, of true. different political stripes in two houses, and the Congress doesn't think anything until it votes as a body to do something. That said, there are plenty of members of Congress who would prefer to let uh, the President take harder decisions. We've had three of these authorizations for the use of military force in the last 30 years, the Gulf War in 1991, the 2001 uh, done right after the 9-11 attacks, and then the Iraq War vote in 2002 for the war that began 16 years ago this week. All of those were a focused moment. Either the country had been attacked or the president stood up and said, we must do this in Iraq as a matter of national security. So the, the president had the initiative in some respect on the two Iraq ones that he said we should do this. Both Presidents Bush initially seemed reluctant to actually go to the Congress, and their legal advisors have been telling them, you don't need to do that. You have the authority under Article II. They were persuaded otherwise to go to Congress. So you had a focus moment where the Congress was at least taking a vote and taking accountability. Having been a staff person and involved to varying degrees on, on all three of those, um, I would say it, a lot of the focus was on the core of what was the objective, and probably less thought was given to a deadline, obviously, mm -hmm. since none of them have one. And every president, if anybody ever surfaced it, would have argued, don't put a deadline on this. We don't know how long this is going to go. And that usually persuades uh, members in that context. In the course of the Iraq 2002 resolution, the White House sent up a very broad open-ended uh, draft, and Senator Biden and Senator Luger began work on an alternative that was narrower in scope and tried to force them to go to the UN first to get the inspectors in and even perhaps get a UN authorization in the same way that has, had occurred in 1991. Uh, but it was a month before the election. There were lots of political pressures, the midterm elections, and um, the House Democratic leader uh, made a deal with the, with the White House uh, on the White House version. So that sort of ended the, the Biden-Luger, uh, what wind they had in their sales. And we had some members, too, in the Senate who were on the 
or liberal side of the specter who were not going to vote for any war authorization, regardless of whether it was a more narrow one or the broader one. So what, what's lacking now is there are members who do care, like Senator Kane, Senator Corker's gone, to try to fix this problem with the 2001 AUMF. But there's just not enough political pressure and interest to do it. Yeah. Because members of Congress are busy, they sit on multiple committees, they have to raise a lot of money to get reelected, they go home every weekend to do events in their districts. And even though it's a fundamental question as Jake laid out about our democracy, and, um, they haven't all made it a priority. And just picking up where Brian left off, a big part of the reason they haven't made it a priority is because as long as they don't act, we still have the 2001 AUMF. And so the president can still go do whatever it is the president is going to do against terrorists. So fundamentally, that pressure never truly builds. It's an abstract problem. It's not, it's not a practical problem of the president doesn't have the tools to fight terrorists. He does. He's taken this very broad, capacious view of what he's allowed to do under the 01 AOMF, so he'll keep doing it. It's, a, it. it's this more kind of nebulous idea that somehow we're not having the national debate we need to have about what this military action should look like in the future. So from my perspective, the only way that you're going to get a new AUMF to deal with the problem of terrorism across the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia is if the president basically says, uh, I'm going to have to take a different approach if Congress isn't making this decision. Now, if you're the president, what's your incentive to do that? It's not that great. Because A, it then starts passing a lot of decision-making authority and discretion back to Congress that maybe you and certainly your national security team would like to keep. And B, it creates very hard issues for you around things that, that Harold and Brian have both mentioned, like time limits, or limitations on which means can be employed, like ground troops, or limitations on which countries uh, can be theaters, or limitations on which groups can be targets. If you're the president, your natural instinct is to want maximum flexibility on all of those issues. If you're the Congress, your institutional instinct should be to put some parameters and definitions around them. Um, so it would take a president who actually was willing to affirmatively cede back to Congress some of the power that is currently residing at his or her desk. And I think the only way that that happens is if this becomes a central campaign theme for somebody who might become president if Donald Trump is not reelected. And actually, when That's you look at the Democratic candidates running for president this year, nearly all of them talk about this issue. Now the question is, they can talk about it all they want on the campaign trail. When they are sitting behind the Resolute desk, do they start thinking about it very differently? That's an open question. But I think the only way the quote unquote process around this changes is if the president decides it's a priority for them. Because as long as they don't make that decision, then the Congress will never quite have the, the, the point of focus to drive, I think, a majority to pass a new authorization. If I could just. Yeah illuminate a little bit what Jake said about the presidential incentives. When President Obama in August or September of 2013 did decide, I'm not, I want to hold back on these serious strikes, I want to go to Congress. There was a meeting in the Oval Office, it was a Friday night. Most senior people, including the Vice President, had gone home. I don't know if you were there, I was in the meeting. Uh, it's been written about in Ben Rhodes's book, so I'll try not to betray secrets that he hasn't. Um, <laughs> because he probably cleared it with the president before he wrote it in his book. Um, there were a lot of people in around that room telling him, don't do this. You are ceding some of your power. Uh, and by the way, Congress may not give you the authority, and then what do we do? So it, the institutional incentives, in the, particularly in the White House, yeah. are all in the other direction. And of course, we haven't mentioned the courts at all. You may be wondering where the third branch is in all of this. Would anyone like to explain why we're not mentioning the courts? There's just very little way for, for there to be a federal judicial oversight of this entire area. Yeah. Well, I completely disagree with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, John, John Hart Ely's book, War and Responsibility, a huge part of it is that if there was a law that actually made these issues justiciable, that well, you, well you know, are we in a war or not? Right. That's not a political question. 
the, the courts have absented themselves from this. That, by, that's a more accurate way to say it. But you know, the Supreme Court in the Zivotofsky case narrowed the political question doctrine. So just as a, mm -hmm. as a doctrinal matter, um, these issues ought to be adjudicated. If, if you look in the famous Dellums versus Bush decision of Judge Harold Green, uh, before the first Gulf War, while he ended up saying that the case was not yet ripe, he also made clear what the legal standards were. But I go back to something Jake said, which I completely agree with. The, the key thing is sunset. Sunset is not repeal. Um, Congress could vote at the moment of sunset to renew it. But if they never have a moment where they have to reconsider this, it will go on forever because it's easier for them to just let it ride. So Congress has to enact action forcing events and one of them is for these laws to expire of their, of their own force so that the, the Congress that exists at the time of the future event can decide whether they want it to continue. Finally, I'm not a fan of Kane Corker. I, 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 I appreciate their impulse, but if you actually look at how it matches up to the criterion I was discussing, it's very weak on these counts. The Merkley is, yeah. bill is much better, and I would say some version of the Merkley bill, which includes um, you know, a, a sunset, real transparency, um, a real repeal, ought to be uh, the, the vehicle of choice. It's, a, it's, it's um, heartening, though, to know that there has been this recent activity at all around AUMFs. Did, I, I saw a lot of disagreement or interest in making a comment. I, or I, was, o I was only going to say that judges don't want to be accountable either. They don't yeah, want these yeah. decisions. So they have found a way to avoid taking them. As, as right. you said, they've absented themselves. But as Harold said, they, they could find cases to be justiciable. They've just chosen not to. Right. There was a brief moment when uh, the Supreme Court, in the context of um, uh, Guantanamo and those related issues um, having to do with um, the treatment of um, enemy uh, combatants um, did momentarily perk up a bit um, to reassert um, in the context of individuals um, some basic um, due process rights, limited as they were. But what we have seen steadily, and we've seen it in the immigration context now, um, I would expect we would see it if the uh, national emergencies issue gets uh, litigated, is that they have taken deference to the executive in certain realms to really an illogical extent. Um, and they have taken the position that when, once you get into a certain arena, um, even explicit fundamental constitutional rights, even explicit limits on, um, for example, the power of the purse, somehow evaporate as soon as the administration waves the wand of um, national security. Um, and um, frankly, I think uh, this president and perhaps others have picked Supreme Court justices for precisely that reason. Um, and that, again, is a failing in the oversight process because um, I think that's the last backstop for that is the Senate confirmation process, which as we all know is badly, badly broken right now. Um, but until that is exercised in a way that um, justices feel um, compelled, at least when they're getting on the bench, um, to assert the power of the judiciary, I think it's gonna continue in a very, very alarming direction. And it only provides incentive then to go further and further and further. Just, just one point I wanted to make in the context of this conversation is that, you know, I've certainly fairly aggressively made the case that Congress looks to avoid accountability when it comes, and, and I think the courts too, when it comes to issues around war powers, particularly when it comes to terrorism because of the risk calculus of somehow getting that wrong politically. Mm -hmm. But there are areas where Congress has no problem uh, asserting power even over the objection of the executive branch when it comes to national security and sanctions is one of those areas. So you've seen a bipartisan sanctions bill on Russia passed last year over the objection of the executive, in fact, tying the hands of the executive in unprecedented ways. In the Obama administration, 
Uh, the Congress was constantly pushing the administration out of its comfort zone on Iran sanctions issues. And so it, it raises an interesting question. Why in this one area is there so much activity, energy, intellectual creativity, um, and in this other area, such passivity? And I think part of the reason is because Congress views sanctions as kind of all upside from their, you know, for them. It's real low cost tools that can have a positive impact and the like, but it creates its own headaches for an executive branch. Mm -hmm. So there are areas, and, and sanctions are not child's play. I mean, these are uses of American power and coercion in the world that have meaningful impacts on our foreign policy. So I do think it's important to, to put into this that this dance between the executive and the legislature isn't always a case of Congress being passive and, and the executive taking on more power. There are places where when the political calculus changes, Congress's desire to act affirmatively and aggressively changes as well. And I think we'll see more sanctions laws passed this year over the objection of the Trump administration because Congress feels this is their prerogative. This is something they know how to do well, want to do, and therefore will do. Uh, just two points to flag. One is um, the Supreme Court is approaching a major gut check with regard to the national emergencies lawsuits. You know, there are five suits already. There'll probably be a fifth from Congress. You know, the, they opened the door, the, the court opened the door to these broad claims of national security by the way they decided the travel ban case. In other words, what they did there was they ignored what the president had actually said, calling for a Muslim ban, mm -hmm. and deferred to what an imaginary, reasonable president might do. <laughs> um, but we're now in the teeth of um, using national emergency power to circumvent Congress's power of the purse. And I think the two justices to watch are, you know, Chief Justice Roberts, it seems to be, has made it clear he does not want the Roberts court to be associated with failure and dysfunction. And I think he will have an important vote. And I also think that Justice Kavanaugh will be in an ex existential moment. If there's a vote he could cast in his first year that would change people's impressions of him or change the storyline, it would be to say that something he knows is not a national emergency is not a national emergency. The other area I want to flag is treaty withdrawal, withdrawal from international agreements. Remember, this is a president who likes to tweet and thinks he has unilateral powers. He likes to do those things like pardon people, take away their security clearance, take away press passes. He believes he has unilateral power to terminate any treaty. He has terminated the um, treaty with Iran, he's terminated the Postal Union Treaty, he's terminated the INF Treaty. Could the president really, by tweet tomorrow, withdraw us from every single treaty to which we're a party, including the UN Charter, the NATO, the WTO? It cannot be that Congress has to pass laws specifically defending treaties like NATO, although it's yeah, a good thing for them to do so. And I think this is based on a misconception of the famous Goldwater case. I think it's been way overread by academics that the president has various kinds of unilateral powers of treaty termination. You know, the Brits cannot withdraw from uh, the EU without parliamentary participation. And it seems to be that constitutional rule has to be litigated that at least as much legislative input to withdraw as is required to enter. I, at the moment, I'm not hardened by the invocation of Great Britain, but, <laughs> but I think you've got to be right. The parliament's I, voting. The parliament's yeah. voting. Um, I, I would just a, add a that lot. Um, part of the problem is that the JCPOA was not a treaty. It was an executive action. So the, you know, by, um, I don't know what Congress otherwise could have done, but um, by allowing the president to proceed in this fashion, it empowers his successors to undo it. And so I think one of, when we talk about the reassertion of congressional authority, one of those has to be the reassertion of the power to confirm treaties um, and to bind the United States. So um, if you live by the executive order, you're gonna die by it. Well, yeah, I mean, Brian should, should speak to this, but just, just briefly, you know, during the Obama administration, 
President Obama tried to pass the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which essentially makes other countries have to live up to the standards of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It imposed no obligations on the United States. And Bob no, Dole no, went down no to new the, obligations. No, I'm no, sorry, no. Because we already have the ADA. Exactly, no new obligations. So Bob Dole goes to the floor of the US Senate imploring his colleagues to vote for this, and it goes down. And, and I watched that spectacle unfold, and I think we've entered a period where getting 67 votes for even modest treaties, let alone potentially um, you know, more impactful on, on kind of American law treaties like a Paris or something else. It's hard for, I think we've entered a considerable period here where that is highly unlikely to happen, and we're going to have to grapple with that. I don't know what the right answer is, but I think it's unlikely you're going to be able to count to 67 for major treaties uh, in the near term on things like this. Uh, even for minor treaties, I think there's been a real shift in the last 15 or 20 years mm -hmm. on just the treaty practice of the Senate. Uh, I will say I, I, I've seen this argument that Jennifer made that uh, the JCPOA was not enduring because it wasn't a treaty, and, and I, I, I'm not yet persuaded by this. That Bush d pulled this out of the ABM treaty, which went through the Senate. Mm -hmm. Trump has given a notice of withdrawal of the INF treaty which went through the Senate, so I, I'm not sure the case is on that is actually clear cut. But in terms of the Senate practice in the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a huge decline in advice and consent treaties going through the Senate. And part of this, I'm gonna get a little bit partisan here, is some of the Republican senators uh, who have been in the Senate for the last couple of decades have had very strong view against treaties per se as an erosion of sovereign, American sovereignty and they just shouldn't be done. Now, yes, every treaty is an erosion of sovereignty because we are giving up something in this, as part of a bargain to get something else that people believe is in our national yeah. interest or national security interest. But when I worked for Senator Biden um, as the chief counsel from 97 to 09. Um, he was not the chairman for most of those years because the Republicans ran the Senate for 10 of the, or nine of the 12. Uh, the two chairmen were Senator Luger and before him, Senator Helms. Now, nobody ever confused Jesse Helms with being an internationalist. Um, and he used to invoke, um, I, th I think it's a Mark Twain line, that we've, we've never, never lost a war and never won a treaty. Um, but the truth is, a lot of treaties went through when he was chairman. Um, now, these were not major treaties that you read about very often, uh, big treaties like agreements like the Iran deal, but a lot of treaties that are important to American interest, particularly in the law enforcement in space, uh, DOJ was going through a process of updating all of our extra, many of our extradition treaties on a bilateral basis and what are called mutual legal assistance treaties mm -hmm. because of the globalization of the world. The Department of Justice and prosecutors often need to find evidence and interview people who are abroad and these treaties provide the framework to do that. And we had one period in the late 90s where we had 50 or 60 treaties went through the Senate in a year under Chairman Helms. That's not happening. Wow. The, the one respect I slightly disagree with, Brian, I don't think treaties erode sovereignty. They are a way that you assert American sovereignty through multilateral regimes. And if we resign from these agreements, like the Paris Agreement, um, we are lame ducks. We have no influence in these. I find it very ironic that, for example, the Law of the Sea Treaty, which has been um, supported by every Secretary of State, every Secretary of Defense, every Chair of the Joint Chiefs for the last uh, 30 years of both parties is being uh, blocked on the grounds of erosion of sovereignty. And then the net result is we surrender the South China Sea to the Chinese and the Arctic to the Russians, and people aren't worried about that as an attack on our sovereignty. And, and I would add that um, we haven't talked too much in the trade arena, but this, of course, um, dovetails with a huge um, problem which we're encountering, which is an erosion of um, our economic tools, um, which include trade authorities. Um, for um, you know, a couple decades at least, um, the um, Republicans were nominally in favor of free trade and 
and, and Democrats were more concerned about those ramifications domestically, and now we have seemingly both parties um, which have gone off the deep end. And so you're not able, one way Congress can really impact foreign policy is ratification of a treaty like TPP, which would have been you know, not only economically beneficial, but according to eight defense secretaries, was of enormous consequence in, just as Harold said, in defending our position vis-a-vis um, -vis China. So I think um, the problem of sort of a know-nothing um, mentality um, in the Senate is a real one, and uh, I think until the American people decide otherwise, um, this is gonna be a real fundamental problem that we have. Um, and barring a constitutional amendment, we're not gonna get rid of the treaty requirement. Um, it's not like the filibuster where you know, the majority leader can snap his fingers. Mm. Well, maybe we could open things up and let our uh, audience in a little bit. I'm, I'm sure this has provoked a number of questions, like whether, whether we're uh, remanded to letters of mark and reprisal. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Let's see. I saw a hand. I mean, in a broad sense, for some members of Congress, uh, being active on foreign policy, the payoff is, can be low. And the risk might not be high either, but it's, if the payoff is low and they have other pressing concerns in their district or state or in their reelection campaign, then that's where they're going to go. Uh, members of the House are running constantly for reelection. Members of the Senate have the luxury of six-year terms, but they have to raise money for uh, intensively at least for three of those six years. And so they're distracted by a lot of other things and they have to do triage on their time and priorities. And even members of the National Security Committees uh, in the two chambers, they don't spend all day doing foreign affairs or uh, their armed services committee work. They're, they're on other committees, they're doing other things. So they do have the luxury of thinking about foreign policy 20 to 30 percent of their day instead of 100 percent that the Secretary of State does. But they're, they're distracted is, is, is part of it. It's, and it's, they have to make choices about when they will push hard and take political risk. And I mean, Mr. Hamilton and Senator Luger probably can answer these questions better this afternoon about how politicians think about these things. I, I would just add one point, which is vote for war. Even if, so there was a moment in the Syria case, uh, the, the effort to get a Syria authorization, when, when Secretary Kerry said something like, this, this action is going to be unbelievably small. I think that was his phrase. He talked about Pimper. He's like, why is Secretary Kerry saying it that way? And the reason was he was trying to get through to members that this was not a vote like Iraq in 02. It was not a vote for a major commitment of US forces. It was for some airstrikes. But the asymmetric risk, if you're a rank and file member who isn't the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee or, you know, or the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is, you vote for something and it goes belly up and American men and women die, like that comes back on you. So why do you want to vote for that? I think that does have a lot to do with these decisions. Um, for people who think, I don't get any of the upside of the vote, the president gets all the credit for that if it goes well, but I'll get the downside because I saw that happen to many people after the votes for the war in Iraq in 2002. Right. I think that that's not, may not be the, the dominant motivation, that's a slightly cynical take, but I think that is a present factor, psychological factor for many members. Terrific, yeah, right here. citizen, uh, that um, President Trump has decided to enact tariffs on the uh, foreign auto industry, uh, citing a Department of Commerce national security study, and he's refused to give that to Congress. 
Uh, I have no idea why, but this has really actually provoked a lot of bipartisan outrage as not only the tariffs, but his refusal to hand over the secure, national security data. In my own mind, I can't imagine why not being able to buy a Honda or a Peugeot or something is a national security interest. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, if you look at Justice Sotomayor's dissent in the travel ban case, she points out that if the majority lets this go through, it's just the beginning of more, what she says, national security masquerades. Um, you know, the Trump administration sees that they can win the travel ban case 5-4 by saying national security, and then the next thing you know, it's national security to separate parents from their children, it's national security to impose trade sanctions, it's national security to force energy grids to buy from uh, coal companies. Uh, it's national security to build the wall that Congress has refused to appropriate. And there has to be a way to get behind this by Congress defining what it considers the actual scope of national security to be. Con Congress has a definitional power in this, which again it should exercise. Uh, the young woman who asked the question there, a very good one. I think a critical part of this is Congress's willingness to take this up and actually push the rock all the way up. When Senator Luger uh, helped to lead the movement for the South African sanctions override, that was a huge moment because it sent the message that uh, the president can't simply ignore the majority will of Congress and the people and then just veto it and just get away with it. And um, at, at a certain point, the president will push the outer limits of credibility on these kinds of national security arguments and as you're pointing out, and um, there will be a breaking point as long as Congress is willing to stand up and assert its own powers. And this is an area where the Constitution specifically designates the power of tariffs to Congress, and Congress has willingly given this up. And when Senator Corker tried to bestir his fellow members to allow a vote to try to claw back this power because the national security exception doesn't exist in the atmosphere. It was given to the president. He couldn't get a vote on the floor of the United States Senate. Um, so that may be, have been a function of this you know, hyper-tribalistic partisan position that we're in. But it also bespeaks that just like presidents, once they've accumulated power, um, aren't going to give it back, it seems that once Congress has given up power, they don't want it back. Um, and that's because I think, frankly, there's always one, one side in Congress whose president is in the White House and it's seen as an attack on their president. And rather than look at things from an institutional perspective and from a balance of power, they look upon this as um, part of their party allegiance. And so um, even decisions that Congress had totally within its authority under the Constitution now are subject to this excessive deference to the president and these sort of open-ended declarations of national security. Perhaps an argument for the courts to be back involved a bit? Well, I think this is a, an important role for a school like this one. When, when the president says something like, uh, I don't know if he said trade wars are, are uh, good and go, easy to good win. And easy, good to win. easy to win, that's right. You do want the students to read about the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act and the way in which Congress personally revised the tariff schedules 56 times, raised the tariff levels, and you know, spawned the Great Depression. Um, maybe the president doesn't care about that history, but uh, the American people should. And it's harder to fact check something like that with something that actually looks like a, a PhD dissertation, but it's certainly something that a school like the Hamilton Luger School, I'm sure, can teach its students over the course. It, there is a received wisdom uh, from sustained historical examination of these questions that shouldn't be ignored. Got, I see lots of students, and I, I'd like to go to a few of them. Uh, thank you, you uh, for coming. I'm Henry. I'm a political science student. Um, I just had a question. Of if you guys could talk about the jurisprudence behind the majority's deference to national security issues on the court. I, I, it's, I feel like it's understandable, but I, I, from a legal perspective, I'm wondering what the motivation is behind sort of uh, giving up the court's authority. Because 
in my, in, at least I'm not a lawyer, but the court's not really accountable to elections like senators are. So, so their decisions aren't necessarily as, uh, they're not subjected to that public scrutiny. So I'm just wondering if you could talk about why the majority votes the way it does and sort of what the legal, what their legal basis is for that. Would you like to take that? Well, you know, most of the justices were lawyers for the president. You know, they, they work for the Solicitor General or whatever. They're used to making arguments defending presidential prerogative, particularly in foreign affairs. But, um, you know, you, you look on the current court, you know, um, Roberts, Alito, Kagan, um, uh, Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh. So, but the other side of it is that the court's jurisprudence in the steel seizure case says the president's powers are not fixed. They fluctuate depending on whether they coincide with Congress's expression of view. So Congress actually has to make its view clear. If Congress dilly-dallies or, or expresses a, a gray, ambiguous view, then the president can say, I have this zone in which to operate. I mean, there's a remarkable moment in the travel ban case where um, everybody understands that in the travel ban case, the great harm was that um, we, we don't judge people uh, by where they come from or who they worship. We judge them individually by the content of their character. And that's why it was like Korematsu, the Japanese internment camp, where they just assumed that a group of people were dangerous because of uh, their ethnicity. And Chief Justice Roberts goes out of his way in the travel ban case to say, Korematsu is a terrible decision, but it has nothing to do with this case. Yeah. Well, if you believe that, I've got a travel ban to sell you, uh, yeah. which is what they did. But as our friend here up front has just pointed out, when you see the national security masquerades that then follow, then there might be a point at which they also say, the court also says, enough is enough. And it might be the moment when John Roberts decides, if I keep going down this way, my court is gonna be a laughing stock. That was one of the great non sequiturs in uh, Supreme Court history, but I think um, Harold puts his finger on the pulse here. Um, for the first time you had the Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice speak out and say there are no Republican justices and no Democratic justices. Um, that's a nice sentiment. Um, it would be nice if they actually acted in ways that simply don't seem to be partisan in nature. But I think when the integrity of the Supreme Court as an institution, which uh, Chief Justice Roberts has spoken publicly about, is very near and dear to him, um, there will be a time when um, they're gonna have to decide these issues or risk essentially um, political and, and constitutional irrelevance. Um, and I think for um, the times in which the court has gone so far off the balance beam, you've then had a political reaction which is very alarming. And now you have Democrats for understandable reasons, I get it, talking about court packing. So you have irrational, excessive partisanship, which bespeaks irrational, or maybe rational partisanship in retaliation, and we're in a downward cycle. So perhaps it is time for the Chief Justice to switch sides, as they say, and start upholding the relevance of his own court. Let's see, how about right over there? Thank you all for coming. My name is Krishna, I'm the senior studying public policy. I wanted to ask you guys about uh, security clearances in Congress and uh, war powers policy. Given the number of congressional staff and members that don't have clearance to view the vital information to inform their decisions, how that impacts the role of Congress in war powers and other national security policy. That's a good question. Uh, members of Congress get a security clearance when they get an election certificate, um, but then they're limited numbers on the intelligence committees who get uh, access to the most secret information that the CIA or the National Security Agency has, and not all of that is provided to every member of Congress. 
the staffs uh, of the National Security, Security Committees have clearances. Uh, and usually, at least in the Senate, a couple of other people in each senator's office have, have a security clearance. Um, so th they're not without access to the information. It's just harder than getting it in the executive branch because of the way that the, both the briefings and the, and the paper uh, intelligence products are delivered and stored. It's just not as easy. When I got into the White House, I went from a situation in the Senate where we logged in every document. We had a catalog. They were in a safe. Most of them were in a safe in the Capitol, not in my office. Uh, in the White House, when you're in a national security job or in the Pentagon, your entire office is a, is a classified room that can store all of these things. So I had dozens of products sitting on my desk and, and, and readily accessible to me without having to jump through a lot of hoops to get to them. So. There's an imbalance, but Congress does have an ability to get classified information. They, sometimes they just have to push to get some of it because not everyone has access to it. And in some ways, members of, of who are not on the Intelligence Committee are second-class citizens and how they are treated. But I think if, if you're worried about two particular things, one, one is the use of um, the security clearance power to punish people who are perceived as speaking out against the president, like John Brennan. Um, you know, the idea that this is a form of punishment, that you use unilateral authority to pardon your friends like Joe Arpaio, and then to punish your enemies. The more pernicious and even more dangerous thing that I was worried about, though, is that in the Justice Department, there are a lot of lawyers with security clearances who are working essentially closely with Mueller's investigation. You know, these indictments ver brought very broad claims about the activities of various Russian groups. And, you know, Mueller's own team is so small, they have to rely on institutional support from the Justice Department to do the diplomatic discussions with uh, foreign governments to get this information. If the president and people around him used the security clearance revocation power to strip career Justice Department people from getting to um, the bottom of the stuff that they're investigating around the indictments, then it contributes to an obstruction of justice. Well, on that, on that note, <laughs> I'm afraid we're out of time. This has been a fabulous panel. Please join me in, help, in thanking our panelists. You all were wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you.